everyone, this is Dr. Tim and Hillary, our social media coordinator. And today we're gonna to talk about basic water chemistry and we're gonna introduce terms. We're just gonna introduce the basic terms that you need to understand a little bit about for your aquarium water chemistry, whether it's fresh water or salt water. So how are you doing this morning, Hillary? I'm doing good. I'm really excited to have this podcast because I think even for people that have been in the hobby for a while that, you know, have been aquarist for years, I think it's always good to go back to the basics and refresh your knowledge and remind yourself like what the basic terms are. Because I don't know about you, but I know as Aquarius and like some of the people I work with, like we do things and we just do them because we've been doing them. We forget the reasons why we do them. And I think we'll probably go into that a little bit with P pH and KH. So I'm excited. Yeah. And uh, you really, you know, like any other hobby, you need to have an understanding of, of the basics. It makes it more enjoyable and you'll have less problems. Um, as you go forward and, and you can converse with people and, and uh, troubleshoot things if that's what you need. So, but it, you know, chemistry, as soon as you put that in a sentence, everybody's brain shuts off and they go, oh, oh, oh. But don't <laughs> worry folks. There's only a couple of equations. They're real simple and there is no test at the end. So just uh, if you need to, uh, you can always hit the rewind we rewind button and uh, review what we're talking about until you fully understand it. And always contact us at info at drtimsaquatics.com. So let's get started. Um, so as I said, you know, once you start saying chemistry and you get into this and you start talking to people, oh, you've got ammonia and oxygen and nitrite and all these terms and it can be overwhelming. And the main thing is, don't let it be overwhelming. Just relax. You'll get through it. Your fish should be fine. And take it one term, one step at a time, like we're doing in this talk. Yep. So let's start with the basics. A lot of times, and we actually get people, you've seen the emails, and they say, I'm, I'm going to do what's, I did what's best for my tank. I used pure water. Now, that can mean a lot of different things. But technically... Pure water is nothing but H2O. Hydrogen here in the red and two oxygens, nothing else in the water. It's absolutely pure. No salt, no minerals. nothing. This is not very good water for fish. It's terrible water for most bacteria. Very few organisms, whether it's fish, bacteria, zooplankton, algae, can live in this water because it's actually pretty reactive. Um, so do not take your tank and start with absolute pure water unless you're going to do a marine tank and add back some sea salts or a brackish water tank and add some sea salts or there's also cichlid salts and things like that but that's not the point of this. We'll get to that in another talk but basically going and getting Deionized water and putting that in your tank is not a good thing to put fish in. Oh, you know, it's funny when I first started in the industry, um, like as, as a person in general, I drink a lot of water and somebody once told me, they're like, make sure you're not just drinking that straight from the filter that like your body, even as humans, like our bodies need some of those other things in the water, just like fish do. So I always thought that was interesting. Oh yeah. Drinking absolutely pure water is, is, is very unhealthy for you. It'll dilute your blood. It'll take the potassium out of your system and your cells will shut down. Uh, so no, you, you need to have, just like you said, humans need to have some uh, minerals in their water. Okay, so let's start with the first thing. What's the most important, the number one thing you need to have in the water? Well, let's start why, why this is all important. You're gonna set up your system and here's, if you're a cichlid person like me, I've been the treasurer of the American Cichlid Association for almost 30 years. Um, it's quite common to keep African cichlids. They can come from Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Malawi. And these lakes are not that far apart from each other. They're all on the border of the country of Tanzania. 
But if you go and you go up, you know, look in the internet and go, I want to kind of duplicate the water of one of these lakes. Mm -hmm. Well, what you're going to find is that the water is very different. Electrical conductivity for Lake Victoria, you know, the highest it gets is 145. Well, look at Lake Malawi. It doesn't even start till 210 in Tanganyika, you know, 600. Wow. TDS, total dissolved solids. We're going to talk about all these, but look at these numbers. You know, Victoria is down around, you know, averaging maybe 100, where Tanganyika is up about 400. Total hardness, you know, 19 to 70 for Victoria. It starts at 186. That is rock hard water. So what does all this mean? pH 8 to 9.0 there at the bottom, alkalinity. We're going to explain these terms, but and the reason is so that you can understand and know that you're going to have to maybe adjust your water to meet these to meet the match what these lakes are. It's amazing to me that like you look at the map and see how close these lakes are to each other and they can have just such different values. Yeah. It's incredible. And it's all got to do with the uh, the localized rock, you know, the the watershed that the water falls into, and then into these lakes. And uh, this this is the cichlids in this area are beautiful, and they rival the colors of any saltwater fish. And there's all sorts of there's fish that only live in shells, fish that feed on other fish in this, uh, the ecology of the cichlids in this region are, are wonderful. But we're talking about water chemistry in terms today. So that's another talk. So <laughs> what's the most important thing you do need in your water? You need oxygen. All aquarium fish, corals, invertebrates need oxygen to survive. But not only the animals that we're looking at and want to keep, but so do the nitrifying bacteria and the sludge removing bacteria, they need oxygen. And one thing you need to realize is that a salt water tank, just by virtue of having the salt in the water, contains about 30% less oxygen than a comparable freshwater tank. Oh, wow. So, I did not know that. I learned something new every time we talk. Yeah, because so, uh, you know people will keep the fresh water and they'll get experience and then they'll go to salt water and they'll, well, I had that many fish in my freshwater tank and why can't I have that many fish in my salt water? Right off the bat because of the minerals, just the water chemistry, this what's called the oxygen saturation, which is the you know most oxygen you can put in the water unless you use some other techniques that's called the oxygen saturation level, it's 30% less in salt water than it is in fresh water. Good to know. Um, first, uh, after that is now pH. This is a basic measure. It's very easy. We'll have another talk on test kits. We're gonna just stick with terms. And pH, always small p, always large H, capital H, stands for power of hydrogen. And what it is, is the measure of the hydrogen ions in water. Now where pH gets confusing is it's a negative number, meaning the more hydrogen ions, the less negative. That's why a pH of one or a pH of two has a lot more hydrogen ions than a pH of eight or nine. Because, and top it off, it's also logarithmic. So that can be confusing. But the main thing for us to remember is that saltwater fish live in a pH. The pH of the world's ocean doesn't matter whether you're at the bottom of the Marianas Trench in freezing Arctic water. The pH is always around 8.2 to 8.4. Whereas in uh, freshwater tanks, it can vary. If you're in the Amazon, when it's rainy season, the pH can be one level. And then as the rainy season ends and things start to dry out, the pH will change. So freshwater fish are naturally adapted to a wider range of pH than saltwater fish. In most cases though, you don't have to manipulate the water unless you're trying to spawn your fish. 
but the importance of pH will become important as we progress through this. Next is total dissolved solids. So the reason we have test kits and things is that when you look at the water, you can't tell, you know, it looks good, but what's in it? And total dissolved solids gives you a quick snapshot of the total ions. So this is not just the H2O, this is everything else um, that's in the water. Salts, even organic compounds, urea, ammonia, all these things are basically some type of a salt or compound that increase the total dissolved. And as it says, dissolved, meaning you, you can't really see it. It's dissolved in the water. And when you hear terms like RO, and that's over here to the left, reverse osmosis or DI, deionization, that's where you've taken the water and passed it through something to take out all these salts and organic compounds to make, as we talked about a couple of slides ago, absolutely pure water. You've taken all this out. And I will say, um, if you have an RODI unit at home, um, or if you've seen them, a lot of times they have the little TDS meters on the top, and that's a good indicator. Like you can always check and see what the TDS is reading to figure out if you if it's time to change your filters on there. Exactly, and so and you and say you're doing deionization where you're it's an ion exchange. You're taking the ions that are in the water, which are calcium and magnesium and sodium and stuff, and you're binding them to a little particle and in exchange what's coming off are hydrogens and oxygens to make H2O. Well, those beads, if you have, if you live here in California, like I do, or even you in Nevada, where you have a lot of dissolved solids, a high TDS in the water, you're going to go through those deionization units pretty fast because you've got a lot of materials, a lot of dissolved solids you have to take out. If oh, you yes. live, if, yeah, <laughs> yeah, or you have to recharge them, they get expensive. Or if you live up in you know, Seattle where the water is very pure, meaning it's, it does not have many dissolved solids in it, the deionization units will last a lot longer because per gallon, they just don't have as much TDS in them. So. I wonder if there's a map anywhere that has like what water looks like across the United States and around the world. Oh yeah, there is. I was actually going to put it up. <laughs> <laughs> Should have put that up there, but there, there is. And uh, I mean, you've got all sorts of local conditions, but in general, anybody that gets water from the Colorado river out here in you know, the desert, we, we have um, very high TDS, but if you live in up in the Sierra Nevada, like Mammoth Mountain area, uh -huh. because that's mostly snowfall and it hasn't percolated through the, the earth into, into lakes and into rivers, Mammoth Mountain water is quite pure because it's rain is just H2O. There's no, you know, it collects things as it falls through, but rain is generally really pure. Or maybe you've heard of acid rain. In some rain, in upper New York, the water there, uh, the lakes got very acidic. The pH dropped because the rain was very acid and it was causing lots of fish deaths. This was a problem in the 50s, 60s, and 70s until they figured out where was this at? Why was this pH dropping and turning these lakes acidic? And it was because of the rain. Interesting. Um, next, we have salinity. Now, this is generally just done in marine tanks because the TDS measures everything. But we're, if in a saltwater tank, you're looking at the total or the dissolved solids, and mostly it's sodium. So you've got chlor sodium salts, sodium chloride, the first two here on the, the left. Then you've got some magnesium and sulfate and you know a lot of calcium, but Salinity is generally used to measure the saltiness of your saltwater aquarium. I like that, the saltiness yeah, of your saltwater aquarium. <laughs> now, and, if you're, 
well, I don't want to get into this too much. I know we're going to talk about test kits another time, but if you're testing salinity, refractometer, would you recommend? Yeah, refractometers. Uh, there's two types. There's two ways to do it, a hydrometer and a refractometer. Um, and we will get into this, but but I think you know, it's not that expensive these days to get a uh, refractometer. And that's, I think, the quickest, easiest way. Plus, mm -hmm. hydrometers, the good ones are easy to break. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And as if you have a salt water, you're just starting out in salt water, because I've run up against this more times than I like to think, water's going to evaporate out of your aquarium. Oh, yes. But only the pure, only the H2O evaporates. The sodium, the salts that are in the water don't. So if, if you're topping off your saltwater aquarium due to evaporation, you need to be topping off with pure water yep. to dilute the salts that are being concentrated by the evaporation. Uh, you know, I had this one person that every time I put a fish in, it just dies. And they said, bring me a sample. And their salinity was 60. You know, so mm. it's, 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 normally the ocean is around 32 to 34. The Red Sea's 38 to 40. Uh, you know, uh, Mono Lake is 90. So that's three times salt water. But I looked at this person and they didn't know it. And I said, are you just adding more salt water to top off, you know, to, due to evaporation? Well, yeah, that's not what you do. It's like, no, you, <laughs> but again, unless you have been shown or, you know, instructed about this, you don't understand. So again, if you have a salt water tank and you're not a water change, but it's evaporating, you yep. need to top up with pure water, not with salt water. Yes, that's a good point. Conductivity um, is a measure of the ability to conduct a current and pure water has a value of zero. These are called microsiemens per centimeter. There's an error in this slide, it's not KH. Conductivity is microsiemens per centimeter. And basically that's a measure of current. And it's a quick way as we, you know, part two where we talk about testing, you'll see a conductivity uh, meter is very easy, and it just gives you an idea of when salts and chemicals and minerals are added to water, they break down into ions. And these ions can be positive charged, like sodium or calcium, or they can be negative charged, like uh, chloride. This doesn't tell you which ones they are. It just tells you how many are in there, because pure water doesn't have any ions, so it can't conduct electricity. The free ions are what conduct the electricity from ion to ion. So the higher the reading or the higher the, the, the conductivity, the more free ions that are in the water. Makes sense. And uh, salinity, conductivity can all be related through equations. Um, most people, getting a refractometer is just the easiest way. But as you saw on that slide about uh, the African lakes, a lot of um, measurements are done with conductivity because you don't need reagents. It's just a simple instrument and it gives you an idea of, of uh, basically how many ions, ions are in the water. As I said, we don't know what those ions are, but we know they're in there. Now hardness is getting a little bit more specific and hardness can be confusing thanks to our German friends from years ago because there's general hardness and there's temporary hardness. Oh, yeah. Temporary hardness is another word for alkalinity and you'll learn in a minute why it's called temporary. But, but hardness now measures basically the calcium and the magnesium in water. Notice what's not in here, sodium. When your hardness test kit does not measure sodium, technically it's called the divalent ions, which di means two. So sodium is Na plus, magnesium and calcium are two plus. And that's what hardness measures. And it can vary. The, 
usually the calcium level is higher than the sodium level in most bodies of water, except Lake Tanganyika. <laughs> so soft water is water that has very little hardness. And that's the water where you, it's hard to make soap lather. It fe, you, know, you get out of the shower down like in Florida and you feel like you've got this film still on your skin. That's very yes. soft water. Hard water, that's water where you can tell you have hard water with an aquarium as it evaporates, it leaves that white film at the top. Yes. Or when you wash your, when you wash your car and you come out and you didn't wipe the water off the windows and there's all these spots, that's the calcium and the magnesium because in the sunlight the pure water H2O evaporates and it leaves back the calcium and the uh, magnesium. And the importance to this is that there are certain fish that do best in soft water, meaning low calcium and magnesium, and other fish that do much better in hard water. It's an easy test to do. You can do what, you know, you don't have to split out the calcium and the magnesium. That'll be in another talk when we start talking about how to measure specific ions. But for right now, total hardness is basically the combination of the calcium and magnesium in your water. Okay. To give an yeah, idea, but, oh, yeah. It's really interesting you, you mentioned this is because I know Vegas has very hard water, but one of the issues for the longest while when I first set up my reef tank is my magnesium was like off the chart levels. And I, I, for the most part, I attributed it to the salt that I was using, but now I'm reading this, it makes me wonder, I'm like, no, maybe that's part due to the water and like me needing to change filters and stuff. Yep. If, if, you know, cause a lot of times when you just starting out, you're thinking, well, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be in this for a long time. Do I want to invest in an RODI unit? And you say, no, you know, I'm just going to do a small tank. But if you live in an area that has lots of calcium and magnesium and you, and you add what a manufacturer says, you know, this many grams or this, this many pounds of salt to, you know, per gallon of water, and it doesn't dissolve or doesn't dissolve very fast, it's because you have hard water and your water already has calcium and magnesium plus the calcium and the magnesium that's in the salt mix and they just don't dissolve very well. Interesting. Now this gives you an idea, Amazonian fish, most of the Amazon river, Amazon basin rivers are very soft water. As we saw earlier, Lake um, Malawi's kind of in that middle 80 to 100. And then Tanganyika is like, do you think you could walk across it? There's so much minerals in that, you know, <laughs> up to a thousand. So uh, bodies of water do differ. And again, if you're, when you're topping up, it's not as um, potentially dangerous in fresh water, but only the pure water is dissolving. So the calcium and the magnesium are being concentrated in your aquarium. That's why you need to do water changes is to dilute these things because they do start to build up these minerals. Yes, water changes are always important. Yep. Alkalinity, also called temporary hardness. Now what this is, is the calcium and the magnesium were the positives. This is basically the buffering. This is the ability of a water to accept acids without the pH changing. Now that sounds complicated, but it's not. It's basically you're, when water, when acids are add, added to water, acids are hydrogen ions. The more hydrogen ions, the lower the pH. Naturally, waters can counteract this um, addition of acids, and that's called buffering. But what you can think about it is that alkalinity is your Tums value. <laughs> it is. Look I, at Tums. Right I like it. Calcium carbonate. So what it is, it's the carbonate and the ability of the water to resist the, a drop in pH as you're adding acid. And I'm sure you think, well, I'm not adding acid, but I mean, only a fool would be adding acid to their aquarium. 
We're going to tie all this up and tie it all together here in a second. You're going to see where that acid's coming from. Okay, right. so just remember that. And, and it is your Tums factor. We have in California, Vegas, we have not only hard water, lots of calcium and magnesium, but we have high alkalinity water. So we have to add a lot of acid to get a change in pH. Again, Seattle, which has soft water, they also have very low alkalinity water. So a small addition of acid and their pH can drop quite rapidly. So how's this all tying? Where's, where's this start? So what we talked about previously is kind of the minerals that are in the water. And if you just set up your tank and you put some, uh, you know, glass, I mean, you know, glass, not there's a fish called a glass fish, but if you just put some fake fish in your tank and let them sit there, your water wouldn't change except for evaporation but nothing much would happen, but that's not an aquarium. We have an aquarium because we wanna put fish and corals and animals in it, see the animals in the interaction, enjoy them. So this is where things start to change where we tie all this together. I'm excited. So you add fish, well, you gotta feed the fish. And some of that fish food's also gonna go down to the substrate. So what happens to this? Well, when you feed the fish, the fish eat and they produce ammonia. Humans produce urea, sharks and rays produce urea, but the, most of the fish that we keep, the bony fish, are ammonia producers. And that's because it just passive diffuses right out of the gills. It's not in their quote urine. It's, it's an ammonia, is a gas that diffuses right out of their gills, cost them no energy. Well, the ammonia is toxic. And as you've probably heard, you've got to go through the nitrogen cycle, which we're not going to talk about. We're just looking at the chemistry. And the bacteria convert that ammonia to nitrite. And then another group convert the nitrite to nitrate. Now that's the ammonia produced by the fish. Well, as that nitrite and nitrate are being produced, it's going to affect the pH, the oxygen, and alkalinity. So now everything's getting a little bit more, not complicated, but interrelated. And that's why we're introducing these terms and that's why you need test kits to see what's going on in your tank. Obviously the more fish, the more food, the more ammonia that's produced. So the more nitrite and the more nitrate. But then you've also got waste. They do produce organic waste. There's also food that, you know, they don't find organic material in the, in the substrate. And that has to be broken down. And bacteria mineralize that into ammonia. So there's another source of ammonia. And what happens that, as I said, the ammonia is excreted as NH3 from the gills through a process called passive diffusion. There's no energy. So it goes from the high concentration of the fish to the low concentration of the water. Makes sense. Now, ammonia, a lot of manufacturers, everybody wants to get you worried about this. This is the cycling. You're, you don't have the right bacteria. You don't have any of the bacteria in your newly set up tank. I think these, this is probably of all the questions that I helped answer online, it's always for the most part about the ammonia and the nitrate and the nitrite. Right, and, and this is all different forms of the chemical nitrogen and it is basic to the system. It sounds complicated, but it's not. We're here to simplify that and just explain what's going on in your system. So you're feeding the fish, the fish you're eating, they're producing ammonia. Ammonia exists in two forms. NH3, which is unionized. You see there's no plus, there's no negative, just NH3. This is the toxic form because as I saw, mentioned, by passive diffusion, it diffuses from the high concentration of inside the fish to the low concentration of the water. Well, that can be reversed. If the ammonia concentration in the water is higher 
then the ammonia concentration in the fish, well, guess what? It diffuses into the fish and that's what causes ammonia toxicity. The fish can't get rid of it. Yes, there's exceptions to all this, but we're not gonna run down that path. We're just talking in generalities. And this is also the form nitrifying bacteria use. And this will be important in the next slide. The other form of ammonia or total ammonia is ammonium, NH4 plus. It's ionized, it has a little plus there. It's a cation because it's positive. This can't get through the cell tissue. So this is not the form bacteria can use. And it can't get back into the fish gills. So it can't diffuse back into the fish. The main thing that determines this, so you have total ammonia equals the combination of ammonia plus ammonium. And the main thing that determines this is the pH. The lower the pH, the more of the total ammonia is in the ammonium or the non-toxic form. The higher the pH, it shifts, the total ammonia shifts to ammonium, which is the toxic, the unionized form that can get into the fish gills. And then, as I mentioned, the ammonium, the bacteria can't use. So if the, if the pH in your tank drops too low, the bacteria don't have the food they need. They can't use the NH4. And all these shifts occur, you know, even at most of the pH that we keep fish at, eight, seven to eight, it's only a few percent to maybe five or six percent of the total ammonia is in the toxic form. But you get up to maybe nine, pH of nine, you're going to you know, do Tanganyikan fish or something. Well, then nearly 20 percent of the total ammonia is in the ammonium form. Now, I've got a question and you can, we can save this for another one if this is steering into a different category. When it comes to getting fish, right? So your fish are hanging out in a contained environment in a bag. They've been in there for a while. They're producing ammonia. Yep. When you open them up, is there a certain way that you should acclimate them to help reduce the toxicity? Yes. And now this is a very controversial subject. <laughs> you can always save it for another talk because I no, know no, there can be a lot going into no, it. No, that's okay. But but because because I am in the camp that so so what's going to happen here? The fish have been in this bag, they're producing carbon dioxide and ammonia. So the pH, the carbon dioxide lowers the pH. The pH is low. And that means that 100% of the total ammonia in that bag is in the ammonium form. It's not toxic. Over, over a long, long you know, weeks, yes, but we're talking hours and days. You acclimate the fish. One, one group says you slowly add water to the bag. So what's going to happen? Your pH is going to rise. As the pH rises, more and more of that non-toxic ammonium is converted to ammonia, which is toxic. And the values in the bag can be quite high and your fish can start to have, you know, suffer and get ammonia poison, um, poisoning just by doing that. I've acclimated, moved, handled a lot of fish. And as long as the temperatures are close, I say get the fish out of the water. I dump the fish into fresh, clean water with no ammonia. The bag water is terrible. This is another reason you bring fish home from the store. One of many reasons you should never dump that water from the store into your aquarium. Take yes. the fish out, uh, dump it through a net, you know, depending on the fish you, you you know, you need to just get the fish into your aquarium water. You do not want to use the store water in your aquarium. Don't put that store no. water in there. Please don't ever do that. 
Yeah, uh, float the bag to make sure the temperature is fine. In most cases, the pH change is not going to be great enough to harm the fish. And just getting it out, to get back to your question, getting it out of that high ammonia, high CO2 environment is a lot healthier than maybe a little shock because the pH is different. Good to know. So, um, so what, what's happening here? Nitrification in, in these picture. Um, so you've got the ammonia bacteria in uh, green here under the microscope and the nitrite bacteria in red. And so you've got NH3 ammonia plus oxygen and it produces nitrite, NO2 minus. That's the first step. Then that nitrite, nitrite is very toxic in fresh water because it binds to the blood in, it, in, in the fish and it inhibits the oxygen from binding to the blood. So basically your aquarium water can be full of oxygen and your fish are suffocating to death. It's called brown gill disease because normally a fish gill is red. That is a sign it's got a lot of oxygen present in the gill. But when there's high nitrite and the blood of the fish can't uh, take the oxygen out of the water, the gill will turn brown. And that's a classic sign of high nitrite toxicity. Why this isn't a big problem in salt water is the chloride has a positive effect. It negates the negative effect of the nitrite. The second step in the process is the nitrite is converted by a group of bacteria into nitrate and O3. Okay. Now, why I'm showing these equations is because this is now where we tie everything together. As you saw here, as the ammonia is converted to nitrite, you're producing hydrogen ions. And as the nitrite is converted to nitrate, you're producing hydrogen ions. What does that mean? Second slide we showed was pH, is the, basically the amount of hydrogen in the water. More hydrogen, the lower the pH. So this is what you can't stop. If you're gonna have fish and you're gonna feed them, which is the whole purpose of having an aquarium, you are naturally producing acids, hydrogen ions, which are gonna be initially buffered by your alkalinity. The higher the alkalinity, the more your, the longer the pH of your water will be the same as the alkalinity, the Tums consumes the acid. But at some point, all the alkalinity will be consumed. You'll run out of Tums. And the continued process of nitrification will cause your pH to drop. And it can, it can drop down into five, which fish can't live at. And this is where people call it old tank syndrome or you know bad water, different things. But it's basically, this is why you need to do regular maintenance, just like you have to clean the cat box and pick up after the dog. That's not that hard. You just need to change water to add back the alkalinity and, and to get the pH back up in that normal, you know, 6.57, 7.58 range, depending on where you live, where the fish are much more comfortable and the bacteria can work. But the whole purpose of showing been talking about these, this equation for nitrification is this is what's causing the change in your aquarium water. That makes sense. Broken down into small little pieces that you can't see, this is what's going on. Right, this is what's going on. And, and people say, you know, it's such a pain or, or, or you know, I, I just want one more fish. I got a small 20 gallon aquarium. Why can't I have more fish? <laughs> well, here's the reason. More fish equals more food equals more ammonia, which means this whole process of alkalinity being consumed and the pH dropping is going to happen faster. And so you have to do more maintenance. You know, when I worked um, in a fish farm out in the desert in California, we had 1.3 pounds of fish per
per gallon of water. Yep, in a 20,000 gallon concrete tank, we would basically have 25 to 26,000 pounds of fish. How did we do that? Well, it was flow through. We didn't recirculate the water. The water came in once and it left. <laughs> that's how we did it. So, you know, if you're going to, if, if you have the money and you, you, know, you shouldn't waste water, but, but basically if you have an open system where you're only using the water once, then you can have more fish if you take care of the oxygen and everything else, but that's not your home aquarium. So home aquariums have a limit. You know, people say your fish grow to the size of your tank. Now that's an old wives tale. Basically they grow to your water quality. If your water quality is poor, your fish aren't gonna grow very well. Just like if you as a human have a poor diet or live in an unhealthy situation, you're not gonna grow well. Your development's gonna be stunted and things like that. And it's the same with fish. So it's better to have a less, you know, smaller population and treat them well, then keep on adding fish. And people are busy these days. If you have that, you know, busy lifestyle and you only have a small aquarium, enjoy a few fish and resist the urge to add more and more fish because you're just going to make more, either more work for yourself or the fish are going to suffer, you know, and we definitely don't want fish suffering. No, plan out the tank plan out like pick your top five or top three fish that you want do your research get those and then call it yeah don't be like uh dr tim when he was six years old and get a bunch of uh, mollies and platies and then go hmm that fire mouse cichlid looks good i'm gonna <gasps> put him in the tank <laughs> yeah then you don't have very many mollies and platies left <laughs> Because he eats them. Learn that lesson the hard way. So yeah, plan your plan what fish can go together. You know, there's lots of resources now of, of what fish can live together. And uh, then, you know, it's it's not a numbers game in terms of having more and more fish. It's about enjoyment and nobody likes to change water and clean the gravel and things like that, but it, it necessary it has to be done. And it's just like a filter. People say, what's the best filter? You can get a canister filter and all this stuff that costs a lot of money and looks complicated. But if you never clean it, then it's worthless because it's going to be clogged and it's not going to work. So you got to get stuff you can maintain. You want an aquarium that you can maintain. And maintenance is basically based on the number of fish and the amount of food. Yep. So nitrification is producing hydrogen ions which is causing the pH to drop. And we can put that in, you know, nitrification produces ammonia. Nitrifying bacteria oxidize that to nitrate to make the water safe to get rid of the toxic ammonia and the toxic nitrite. In the process, they're producing acid, hydrogen ions, and oxygen's being consumed. That means that the alkalinity is buffering the hydrogen ions, but eventually the alkalinity runs out and now your pH drops. And when your pH drops below 6.5, nitrification slows. Below four it's, or five, it stops and ammonia starts to build up. And this, this is what's happening in your aquarium, why you need to do routine maintenance. Do not believe anybody, any company, anything that tells you you never have to change water. <laughs> it's bunk. And, and anything that starts with magic, avoid. <laughs> Unless you're in Vegas at one of the shows. But for an aquarium, there's no magic. It's all chemistry and biology. Yes. And this is what can happen. This is actual measurements. You now you see as you add, you know, the pH starts, the, the alkalinity is uh, dropping and the pH is dropping along with it. And your alkalinity, as soon as it goes down to zero, well, then your pH can drop and you can have aquariums even here in California that can go from a pH, normally it's about eight down to five or lower over time because of this process. This is this, the reason you need to do water changes. It's crazy. It's, and it's not hard. It's not expensive either. Nope. Then you have phosphate. That's the last one we're going to talk about. Phosphate is a building block of all cells. And it comes from your food. And people say, well, we'll just make a food that's phosphate free. That's like a gasoline with no octane. We call that water. 
We hydrogen yeah. vehicles are coming, but we don't have them yet. Okay. You need phosphate. It's what all cells need. It comes from the food. Another primary source is if you're using frozen food, phosphate's a preservative. That's why you should always rinse your frozen food before you put it in the, your tank because it does have a high level of phosphate. The problem with excess phosphate is that it can stimulate uh, algae growth. But we don't want algae. You know, we're trying to have a nice aquarium. We don't want it covered in algae. So you want to- like Go ahead. It sounds like it's a nice little balancing act. Like you need some for life, but too much can cause lots of life that you don't want. Exactly. And especially if you put a nice bright light, you know, LED or whatever, right over your tank, light and phosphate equals algae. Yes. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug one of our previous podcasts. We do have a podcast about organics. So if you want to learn more about this, go check out our other podcasts. And there's a whole, like an hour long talk about it. It's another fascinating talk. Thank you. But this is, as you can see, you know, aquariums are great to introduce your kids to uh, basic water chemistry, but also basic ecology. You know, you're adding food and you have these animals and they're in this closed system. Why do you have to maintain it? What's happening here? How things are all interconnected, just like the world's all interconnected. The world's just basically a giant aquarium. I like that. So water chemistry basics, we've covered the terms. Yes. Next talk, we're going to go through the test kits. Okay, how do you measure these things? Then we'll get into another talk where we're going to talk specifically about reef chemistry. If you're keeping a saltwater tank, a reef tank, there's some things that we didn't cover specifically that are more important to that type of tank. And then we're gonna put chemistry and biology together because that's what's really fascinating is, is how all this life, and that's what it is, that's it's and how it works and comes together so you can understand things. I think if, I'm a firm believer that if you know all aspects and everything that goes into these tanks that you're keeping, you're going to have a better chance at success because you know the chemistry, you know the biology, you understand why things are happening the way they are. It allows you to be a better aquarist. Yes. And you might understand a little bit about the world around you too. Can I get a plug in for that? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we could use a lot of that. Yeah, we could. So that's our talk today. Thank you very much for listening to the Dr. Tim's podcast. I'm Dr. Tim and Hillary. And thank you so much for listening. All right. Thank you. Okay, I think we got it. Okay, it still says that it's recording at the top of my screen. Yeah, I'm working.